Shamil de Blob Gazia versus Jarzinho Rosenstrike. We are only five days away from this epic fight night. And that's right. This is actually one of the best fight nights of the year. And I'm about to give my breakdown and predictions for every single fight on this card. I know the main event is underwhelming. I totally get that. It's another Jarzinho Rosenstrike main event, kind of undeserved. It should have been Umar Nurmagomedov. But this card is stacked with talent, with prospects that have tons of potential. There are so many interesting young fighters on this card. We have the return of the great Steve Ursik. We have the debut of Bekzat Almakan, who is Umar Nurmagomedov's opponent. My goodness, I'm still trying to memorize his name, but he's nasty. He's pretty damn good. And we also have a couple of other really interesting prospects on this card. So without further ado, let's get into it. And as always, make sure to check the timestamps in the description for my take on a particular fight. And now, starting with the first fight, Abdul Karim El Selwadi versus Loic Radzibov. Loic Radzibov is a Mateus Rebecki victim. Now, I'm not looking too deeply into that. And on the other hand, we have El Selwadi, who just stomped out the British prospect, George Hardwick, who everyone was talking about. And they were talking about how he's just folding everyone up with body shots. And this is a nasty British striker. And El Selwadi pieced him up, you know, basically was countering him with big overhands, marching him down, landing the jab on him, fighting well on the back foot. And he's got phenomenal cardio too, even showcased his wrestling a little bit in that fight. And I'm going to pick him to beat Loic Radzibov. Because listen, as much as Loic Radzibov has the OV at the end of his name, um, and I know he's outgrappled Esteban Ribovich, he's not that good. All right, now, of course, again, I'm not looking too deeply into him getting destroyed by Mateus Rebecki, who's on another level. But I think he's going to get pieced up in this fight. Uh, he looked to slow down a lot in the Ribovich fight. And El Sawadi can wrestle, and I think that he will be able to dominate this fight on the feet. He's got a nice jab. He's got really good instincts in the pocket. Like, there were many moments where uh, we saw George Hardwick trying to land something big on him, and El Sawadi would dip his head off to the side, counter with perfect timing with an overhand. And this guy's hungry. This guy's extremely hungry. He's going to go out there with some righteous anger, and he's going to take this fight to Loic Radzibov. He's going to impose his will with high output. And the last thing I need to say about Loic is he's so slow. He's super slow. He's plotty. Looks like the guy's fighting in slow-mo. So I'm going to pick El Sawadi to win this fight uh, via dominant decision. And yeah, so let's get on to the next fight, which is Christian Leroy Duncan versus Claudio Ribeiro, Roman Copula victim. All jokes aside, guys, Claudio Ribeiro is coming off of a KO loss. He's just had a really rough go in the UFC so far. He's been finished twice now, the first time by Abdul Razak Al Hassan, which was his UFC debut. His only win is over Joseph Holmes. And it took him a while to get that TKO over Joseph Holmes. Now, we know that Claudio Ribeiro, he's a big powerhouse. He hits hard, but he's just lacking a little bit of that skill. You know what I mean? He, he's chin. I don't really trust it. And I think that Christian Leroy Duncan, I like that this guy was able to reel himself back in his last performance against Dennis Tolulin because the first fight that I saw of his in the UFC, another, again, British prospect that was getting a lot of hype, he disappointed big time. He came out there trying to be Mr. Flashy. He was doing the, the Darren Till conductor arms. He was, you know, doing the spinning attacks. And he basically got schooled and shut down by the basics. Armin Petrosian uh, brought him to class. But in his last outing, I saw him reel himself back a little bit. And he was more patient. He was sticking behind his front kick to the body. And most importantly, he got the TKO over an extremely tough, durable game Dennis Tolulin who's almost like a, a Nate Diaz on the feet. He's so tough. He's so durable. He's a rollover on the ground. But Christian Leroy Duncan beat him in the clinch in close range where Tolulin's pretty scrappy, and he was messing him up with elbows, nasty elbows. And I think that he'll be able to keep Claudio Ribeiro at a distance, who is kind of, you know, he, he's a big dude, but he's kind of small at the same time. He, I don't know how tall he is, but he, he feels like he's getting towered over by all of his opponents. Um, 
He cannot be 6'1". He's listed at 6'1". There's no way. I think he's going to be a lot shorter than Christian Leroy Duncan. And I think that Duncan is going to keep him at bay with the long rangey kicks. And if he gets on the inside of Claudio Ribeiro, I do predict that we could see another TKO in the clinch, maybe with elbows. So I'm going to go with Christian Leroy Duncan. Just seems to be more comfortable on the feet, whereas Ribeiro is going to kind of depend on that wild man flurry KO chance. And he isn't exactly Mr. Durable. Uh, he doesn't have the deepest tool bag. So I'm going to go with um, Christian Leroy Duncan. I, I really do trust a win over Dennis Tolulin a lot more than Claudio Ribeiro's win over Joseph Holmes. So let's get on to the next one. Javid Basharat versus Eamon Zahabi. This is an easy one. This is an easy one. Now, Eamon Zahabi, man, uh, the only reason you're going to pick this guy is because he's related to Faraz Zahabi, I guess. But he's 36 years old. He's been around for a while. I'm going to go with Javid Basharat by Stinky Boring Decision. Okay? I think he's going to take down Eamon Zahabi, control him on the ground, and outpoint him on the feet with pitter-pat kicks and pitter-pat jabs. So... The reason I'm picking him and I'm confident that he wins this is because A, uh, Eamon Zahabi's way to win this fight is by a one-punch KO. He does have some KO power. He does have some quick twitch ability, but that's kind of it. He's not exactly the best grappler. He has very low output. And Javid Basharat, yeah, he's boring, but he's also a very smart fighter. He's defensively sound. He plays it safe. He really just uses his striking to bide his time on the feet in order for him to find an opening to get a takedown. Javid Basharat's like 28 years old. Eamon Zahabi's 36. So I have to go with Javid Basharat. Another instance of the Basharat brothers not getting a bump up in competition. If he wins this fight, he's going to be like 4-0 in the UFC. And everyone's going to be talking about him. All the hardcore fans are going to be whispering in everyone's ear about him. But still, not a bump up in competition. The exact same level of opponents he's been fighting. Still unable to get a finish. And it's not necessarily all about a finish. But I want to see him get a bump up. I don't think that these Basharat brothers are that great. But they're good enough to be ranked eventually. I think he gets this one done fairly easily. Eamon Zahabi is just very low output. He's willing to stand on the back foot and not really do a whole lot. I mean, Ricky Tercios had a razor close fight with him, and Ricky Tercios ain't nothing special. Uh, Eamon Zahabi, I, I do believe that he'll be able to stay in there a little bit. Now, part of that, in my opinion, main, I mean, listen, he trains with Faraz Zahabi. That, that's basically his brother, and I think that Faraz Zahabi has phenomenal jiu-jitsu. I mean, he's always talking about it, right? So I would like to think that Eamon Zahabi has the basics down when it comes to submission defense, and he's basically the, the perfect concoction for a tough out, right? A high-level coach's brother that has all the basics down, maybe can't put it all together, maybe not as the most vicious guy. Maybe he's just a lifelong martial artist, not necessarily a, a fighter's fighter, but either way, I am going to go with Bash... <laughs> I am going to go with Javid Basharat to get this one done, man. Another decision. On to the next one. Eric Anders versus Jamie Pickett. I have to go with Eric Anders because Jamie Pickett has lost his last four. His best win is over Joseph Holmes. And man, this guy's been in the UFC for a minute. He is two and seven. No, he's two and six. All right, and his best wins are over Lorano, Strapoli, and Joseph Holmes. I mean, come on, man. I know Eric Anders ain't great, but I can't pick this guy to win this fight. He's losing to Josh Fremd. He lost to Dennis Tolulin. Nothing wrong with that, but Tolulin was beating his ass. Kyle Dawkins beat him. Jordan Wright beat him. Jordan Wright beat him. Jordan Wright. Jordan Wright has one of the worst UFC records ever. Jamie Pickett's just not UFC caliber. Eric Anders is going to be the tougher guy. He's going to have the power advantage. He's going to have the ability to take this fight to the ground with that uh, football explosiveness. All right. This guy has been able to put together a double leg. And you got to look at the people that he's losing to. Andre Muniz, Jung Young Park, the Iron Turtle. No shame in losing to Jung Young Park. No shame in losing to Mark andre Barriou. Mark andre Barriou is mid-tier level in the UFC. I would say that... Eric Anders is right below that, and Jamie Pickett is hanging on for dear life. I'm going to go with Eric Anders to win this fight. I think he gets this one done by decision. Jamie Pickett may have the 82-inch reach, and he may have, you know, the long, wiry ability, but he just can't He can't put it to use, goddammit. So I'm not picking him to win this fight. I can't. I'm going with Eric Anders. Boring decision. He's got the thudding shots. He's got the bruiser style. 
and Jamie Pickett, it's like, what does he really have? Okay, what does he really have? When the going gets tough, we've seen him get finished, and he's not even a tough out. So I'm going to go with Eric Anders. Let's get on to the next one. Raul Rosas Jr. versus Ricky Tercios. This is rumored. I'm not 100% sure if this is actually going to be on this card. I checked Raul Rosas Jr.'s Instagram. I don't see anything. I checked Ricky Tercios' Instagram. I don't see anything. I don't see these guys posting. Uh, Big Marcel said that it wasn't actually going to happen after he posted that it was going to happen. I don't know what the deal is, but my pick is the same. I think Raul Rosas Jr. is going to destroy Ricky Tercios if this fight happens. I'm going to pick Raul Rosas to take Ricky Tercios down with ease, and I think he's going to submit him in the first round. Uh, we could see a second round submission or maybe just a dominant decision. And the reason I say that is because Ricky Tercios has been taken down before. There's nothing particularly special about his game on the feet. Raul Rosas is a guy that, you know, listen, he's in the UFC for a reason. You're not making it into the UFC at the age of 18 if you're a scrub. This guy has a lot of talent and potential. He's learning lessons early on in his career. And the one guy to sun him so far lost the first round and got dominated. I'm talking about Christian Rodriguez. Raul Rosas, I think, is going to have learned his lesson, not blow his load early on. And I think he'll be able to slow things down a little bit and utilize his grappling skill and his submission ability to be able to get this one done. So I am going to be picking Raul Rosas Jr. by first or second round submission. So yeah, not really looking too deeply into his last win though over Terrence Mitchell, who was just leaving his chin on a silver platter. But either way, Raul Rosas came out there uh, and he was swinging hammers. And I don't think Ricky Tercios has hammers in his hands. And I don't think that Raul Rosas has to even fear what's coming back in his direction. So he's basically up against a heavy bag that's there to be taken down that, you know, is basically a, a tough out. He was programmed to be a tough out, but Raul Rosas is uh, legit, knows how to impose his will. He's like a Hamzat Chemaev in the first round against these lower level guys. So not saying he's Hamzat. I'm saying in the first round against these lower level guys, he'll be able to dominate anyone. If he could slow it down, he will 100% win. Let's get on to the next one. Umar Nurmagomedov versus Bekzat Almakan. You guys remember I was talking smack about this fight. I'm a lot more interested now. Okay, now to be fair, I did actually watch some Bexat Almakan footage before I made my initial video about it where I was kind of crapping on it. But that was just because I wanted Umar to fight someone that's well known, like a Javid Basharat, just someone that the fans are aware of. But this is going to be a good fight, honestly. This is probably the best fight on the card. This is basically Umar Nurmagomedov's Armand Saryukian moment that Islam Makhshev had back in the day, where Makhshev had more experience in the UFC and Armand was making his debut. Bexat is no joke. He's essentially like a mirror matchup to Umar, all right? They're very, very similar fighters and the way that they move and the way that they close the distance and throw strikes, their speed, their well-roundedness. Bexat is a monster, dude, all right? He's got the same quick twitch ability, the same unpredictable way of striking. I mean, even watching this guy's fights, like sometimes you can't even fucking figure out, is this Umar or is this Bexat? Really, it's it's that similar sometimes. Um, but I have to err on the side of caution and go with the guy that's more proven in the UFC, that's been under the bright lights more. And you have to think that, you know, listen, three weeks notice fighting a Nurmagomedov in a big fight night where everyone's excited to see the return of Umar, that's a lot of pressure on the shoulders of Bexat. And I have a feeling that instead of fighting like a bat out of hell early, where he's going to be putting it on Umar, he is going to be super reserved, okay? Whereas maybe it's a better idea to fight like Diego Lopez was fighting against Mavzar Evluev, rather than being super patient and just reacting to what your opponent's doing. Because I honestly don't know if Bexat's going to be able to win a decision. If he does, I'll be shocked. No, 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 no. I won't be shocked, but that'll just mean, holy fuck, he's the real deal. Uh, I guess I just think he's going to be overly concerned with hanging in there and surviving and not getting KO'd and not making mistakes more than finishing Umar, okay? Um, now, Bexat, he's a little bit heavier with the boxing, whereas Umar's a little bit heavier with the kicking. 
Umar's kicking game is nasty, okay? And, and the most impressive thing from him are his front kicks, specifically his lead leg front kicks, where most people use the lead leg as like a little teep to the body to get some distance. Umar uses it as a damaging weapon, like to crush your face with it. And he lifts it up all the way in the air and he freaking pushes all the way through. I've never seen anyone throw it like that. And he's gonna be doing good work with this. So be on the lookout for that weapon. Umar's also got some ridiculously fast question mark kicks. Some of them are so fast you'll literally miss it unless your eyes are glued to the screen. So I think he's going to be keeping Bexat at bay early. He's going to have a striking battle in the first round because he knows that Bexat has good takedown defense. He knows that Bexat has uh, an ability to, to react well and, and latch up a submission or to reverse a position. And I think he's going to kind of lull him into the idea that we're going to go tit for tat. We're going to be striking. In the second round, I think Umar's going to get a takedown. He's going to rack up some control time. He's maybe going to find that Bexat is a little bit hard to manipulate on the ground. But at the same time, it's like, you know, we haven't really seen a whole lot of Bexat off of his back. Okay, I've seen him like reverse positions when someone shoots on him. But if Umar takes him down and puts him on his back... I mean, we've seen some of these Dagestani guys off of their back, and they're not that great, right? It's Volkanovski beat the fuck out of Islam, put Islam on his back. It's not impossible to keep one of these, you know, Ovs or Zats on the ground. So I do think that Umar will be able to rack up some control time, and maybe in the third round, uh, due to a lack of success, Bexat will get frustrated, and maybe he'll make a mistake on the ground, and he'll leave his neck out there for Umar to snatch... So I'm going to go with a third round submission for Umar Nurmagomedov. But that's just because, again, it's been a long time since we've seen him fight. I know he's coming off of an injury, but it's been a year and a few months. He's probably gotten a lot better. And he was already a sick fighter when we saw him last. So I just think it's his time now. If he wins this fight, it's time for a, a top 10 opponent. And for Bexat, he'll show a good version of himself. Unless he gets KO'd in the first round, which is always possible. But if that doesn't happen, he'll look really good. People will be impressed with him. And I have high hopes for this guy in the future. This guy's a monster in his own right. But Umar, he's a bigger monster and he'll get the job done. More mature, more experienced. And I think he'll be more confident when it comes to imposing his will. So let's get on to the next one. Steve Ursic, the great king Steve Ursic, of course. We got to put some respect on his name versus Matt Schnell. Now, although Steve Ursic is a Sean Gucci victim, I do think he's pretty good. All right. Now, losing to Sean Gucci is not the best look, um, but Sean Gucci is, is an all-time great, so we have to let that slide. This time, Steve Ursic is fighting someone that may not exactly be the most durable. All right. Let's be honest. Matt Schnell has hardly any chin. He is one of the least durable fighters I've ever seen in the UFC. He literally does a chicken dance when he gets hit clean. And even though Steve Versick is not Mr. Powerhouse, he does have some good accuracy. He does have some really good precision and timing. And I think that he'll be able to plant a nice right hand, maybe a head kick on the face of Matt Schnell. And if he lands something flush, he probably is going to wobble Matt Schnell, uh, maybe. Matt Schnell will shoot a takedown, and Steve Versick will wrap him up in a submission. He does have some good wrestling. He does have some good submissions. And so I am going to pick Steve Versick to win this one. Now, a lot of people have been hyping him up, all right? We have everyone in Australia holding the Steve Versick banner, and this is like their new king. This is like, you know, everyone treats him like he's the man, and for future champion, future champion Steve Versick. He's pretty good. He's pretty good. And, you know, he did a little bit better than I thought against Alessandro Costa, even though the second round wasn't so hot and the, the third round wasn't so hot. Steve Versick still went out there and did his thing. He still planted some good ones on Alessandro Costa. And, you know, Matt Schnell, he fights like he needs a finish at all times, but he doesn't have the freaking durability to make me confident in his chances to get it. You know, he doesn't have the power to make me confident in his chances to get it. So... I'm going to go with Steve Versick here. You know what I mean? Matt Schnell's great comeback moment at UFC Long Island against Sudamary. Phenomenal fight where he got dropped a bunch of times and then he, you know, got Sudamary down and just totally mashed him up on the ground, ended up submitting him. 
he was able to get the victory because Sudamary is not necessarily a good grappler. I don't see him being able to reverse a position on the ground if Steve Versick has a dominant position. And I, I just, you listen, man, he's been knocked out by basically everyone. He's been KO'd by Font. He's been KO'd by Hector Sandoval, Alexander Pantoja, Brandon Royval choked him out. Um, and Mateus Nicolau knocked his ass out. And he wobbles around every time he gets hit. So I like Steve Versick's, you know, wiry, crisp, basics, down the pipe. He's got decent kicks. Uh, he, he looks like he, he has, he's got a noggin on him, Steve Versick. He's got a noggin on him. He, he's thinking out there. He's thinking on the fly. And I could tell, I could tell if a fighter's thinking, if they're thinking, sometimes I say the word impose your will. And what I mean by that is the ability to dictate the fight. It's not always walking someone down, marching someone down, with relentless pressure. Sometimes it, it could just be you on the back foot, but you're thinking and you're planning things. You're trying to, you're trying to destroy the leg trying to get to that body, right? Steve Ursick, he's a thinking man. He's going to have the investment shots. He's going to be trying to set things up and he will be able to take this fight to the ground. I do believe that his wrestling is good enough to take Matt Schnell down. And I just think he's the smarter fighter. Uh, I think he's the more mature fighter at this point, even though he has less experience. So I'll go with Steve Ursick and I'm going to pick him to win this fight via second round KO. No, 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 no. Second round submission, okay? I think he's going to rock Matt Schnell. I think Matt Schnell is going to shoot on him. And I think we're going to see Steve Ursic wrap up like a Darce, maybe a, a mounted guillotine, maybe a head and arm. Or we could just see a KO, but Ursic's going to be able to plant something clean on the chin of Matt Schnell. If he can't hurt Matt Schnell and he goes to decision with him, then that's kind of going to be a cause for concern in this fight. But Ursic is a clean technical fighter and... Um, Decent output, well-rounded. He's going to be able to get this one done. Not the kind of opponent that I'm going to be picking against him. So he gets this one done. He'll move on to be 12-1 and one in the UFC. On to the next one, Alex Perez versus Mohamed Makayev. I'm going to go with Mohamed Makayev by third round submission. He's a mythical fighter. Literally one of the greatest third round fighters in UFC history. And I don't know what it is. He's like losing every single fight. He's on the verge of getting fraud checked. Things are razor close against opponents that he's expected to run through. And in the third round, despite having trouble in the first and second, he cuts through people like nothing ever happened and easily submits them like nothing happened. And I have to pick that to happen again, all right? Alex Perez has been subbed in his last two fights. He's only fought twice in the last like four years, and he's got subbed in the first round of both of those fights. Remember, he got submitted by a guillotine against Davidson Figueredo in a championship fight, and he got submitted against Alexander Pantoja in a number one contenders fight first round. I think Makayev is going to do that in the third round. The first two rounds are going to be close. Perez is probably going to be hanging in there on the feet. They're going to be going tit for tat. Muhammad Makayev is going to be biding his time. Eventually, he'll find an opening to get the takedown. He won't do much with it. He does not have great ground and pound. He doesn't have the best ability to pass someone's guard. Um, but in the third, we'll see all of that vanish, and Muhammad Makayev will get it done. That's literally how all of his fights go. This is a step up in competition. Even though Perez has been inactive, uh, it is a bit of a step up. Perez is going to be a little bit harder to take down than Tim Elliott. I don't think he's going to put up as good of a fight on the ground because Elliott is wild. He's unorthodox. He's crafty. He takes a lot of risks. But I think Makayev will keep him on the ground uh, successfully and he'll he'll get something going with a submission. So, yeah, Perez is not going to get a leg kick TKO this time like he had over Juicy Formiga. Makayev's not just going to stand in front of him. And I also expect Makayev to look a little bit clunky on the feet. Uh, I'm still not impressed with his striking. Hopefully he's leveled up. It's been a minute since he's fought. What, when was the last time? Tim Elliott, that was on the Maksha Volkanovski 2 card. Actually, that wasn't so long ago. That was in October. His fights, to be honest, are a little bit forgettable because he's not putting on statements, right? He's getting these third round submissions after very underwhelming fights. It is what it is, though. I'm picking Mohamed Bakayev. Uh, he'll extend that streak to 11-0, and I think he'll get a number one contenders fight after this. Maybe him versus Manel Cap. That would be interesting. So let's get on to the... Maybe him versus, actually, Brandon Roy Val or Brandon Moreno. I'd love to see it. So next up, co-main event, Vitor Petrino versus Tyson Pedro. I'm going to go with Vitor Petrino to win this fight 
via submission, all right? I, I think he's going to take down Tyson Pedro with ease, and I think he's going to eventually get him with some kind of a submission. Maybe he even knocks him out, but Tyson Pedro's chin is pretty good. Either way, I'm pretty confident in V... No, 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 no. Screw that. Vitor Petrino by Big KO, all right? Tyson Pedro's really hittable. He leaves his hands down. He keeps his chin on the silver platter. And this time, instead of having pillow hands Anton Turcali in front of him, who's just not dangerous, he has Vitor Petrino, who has nasty power, who's probably one of the biggest light heavyweights in UFC history. The dude is literally built like a fucking tank. He's shredded as well. I think he's better than Vitor Belford. All right, now, I know that that's going to catch some people off guard. I know that the old head fans are going to be up in arms. But I rewatched Vitor Belford versus Anderson Silva because I was searching up Vitor to watch Vitor Petrino's fights on ESPN+. Plus, and there was Anderson Silva and Vitor Belford. Now, of course, beautiful KO by Anderson Silva. I'm not going to take anything away from him. It almost seemed like that was a scripted fight. They were just looking at each other for the first few rounds. I'm sorry, the first few minutes. And then it's almost as if like at the two minute mark, okay, we agree to start throwing punches. It's really a weird fight. I'm not saying it's scripted at all. It's just a really weird looking fight. Dude, every single time, and not Anderson Silva, he looked great. Every single time I rewatch some of these old heads, I'm disappointed, man. And, I, and then I go watch Vitor Petrino. And even though he's in there with Modestus Piskowskis, who's nothing special, Let's not forget that Modestus Spikowskis would probably be competing for the belt against Anderson Silva back in the day, okay? And now I see Vitor Bell, for, no, I'm sorry, Vitor Petrino, and he's in there, and he's in there, boom! Quick jab, snappy jab, uh, no tell on it. For a big bodybuilder-looking dude, you don't really expect something nice and fast, untelegraphed, like the jab that Vitor Petrino throws. He's got a great jab on him. And I think that's going to be really good in this fight because Tyson Pedro, as I said, just leaves his chin open. And Vitor Petrino is not the kind of guy you want to get hit by uh, with a clean shot. All right. We saw how he flattened out Modestus Bukowskis with a big left hook. Um, yes, this is a big bump up in competition. Tyson Pedro slept uh, his last opponent and Vitor went to a decision with him, of course. But styles make fights. And... I think that Vitor Petrino is going to be able to take down Tyson Pedro whenever he wants. I think that Vitor Petrino is going to be the guy that's landing the much more damaging shots. And this is not Anton Turcali, who's got pillow hands and no durability, who's just going to fall and get rocked by like the first clean shot that lands. So I do expect Vitor Petrino to win this one via physicality. He's going to be marching down Tyson Pedro the whole time. He's going to be getting kicked. But he's going to be landing some body kicks of his own, some big stiff jabs. Look out for that jab of Vitor Petrino. It's excellent. And eventually, he's going to get his hands on Tyson. He's going to take him to the mat. He's going to keep him down with ease. And with the threat of the takedown established, I think we might see Vitor Petrino have even more success in the second round on the feet. I think he's going to land a big bomb in the pocket on Tyson Pedro, who will be leaving his hands down. He'll have his chin out on a silver platter. And we could see Vitor Petrino rock him. On to the main event, Shamil the Blob Gazia versus Jarzinho Rosenstrike. I'm going with Jarzinho. This is a bump down in competition, and I don't care what anyone says, Shamil Gaziev hasn't beat anyone like Chris Dawkins. <laughs> okay? Uh, I'm joking. I'm going with Shamil Gaziev to get this one done by first round submission or ground and pound. Now, we know that Jardinho is extremely dangerous on the feet. He has a lot more power than Shamil. Shamil's only win in the UFC is over Martin Budai, who is pretty damn good. Martin Budai was on a four or five fight win streak. Not a finisher, but a guy that pours it on people and breaks them with relentless pressure and output. Shamil Gaziev beat Martin Budai with Martin Budai's style. He literally, like, put it on Budai, beat the fuck out of him up against the fence, just overwhelmed him with volume, took him down at the end of the first round, weighed, uh, weighed him down, and in the second round, rinse and repeat, standing TKO, Martin Budai was done, he wasn't fighting back, he broke him. Shamil Gaziev, pretty good gas tank for a heavyweight, couldn't really hurt and drop Martin Budai, he doesn't have the same pop as Jarzinho, but it's like he didn't have to fear Budai as much, he has to fear Jarzinho Rosenstrike. He's going to be shooting takedowns, and he will get one. He will, all right? Like, we could talk about Jarzino Rosenstrike beating decent levels of competition, having a lot of experience in the UFC, and fair enough, 
it's not like a lot of guys have really tried to take him down. Only two that come to mind are Curtis Blades and Jelton Almeida. First of all, the fact that Curtis Blades couldn't finish Jarzino Rosenstrike is a testament to how overrated Curtis Blades' grappling has been throughout his UFC career. That is insane to me that he couldn't get a finish. But Jelton Almeida steamrolled this guy. And I think that Jelton Almeida is really freaking good. But in hindsight, he wasn't as good as I thought because he still couldn't finish Derek Lewis with like six weeks notice, which is kind of crazy. But Shamil Gaziev, the dude's like 260. If he takes down freaking Rosenstrike, Rosenstrike's not going to know what to do. Like this dude looks like he's never done jujitsu a day in his life. So I have to go with freaking Shamil Gaziev. I think he's going to take down Jarzinho and we're going to see a look on Jarzinho's face as if he's seen a ghost. Not going to know what to do. Shamil's going to pass over into Mount effortlessly. He's going to beat the fuck out of him. Maybe he'll get like a, a freaking Kimura or an arm triangle. He'll, he'll get a big heavyweight submission and he'll put his name on the map. I, I can't pick Jarzinho, man. Like he's only chinning people that are strikers. Now, of course, like he can chin anyone in the heavyweight division, but people have been able to get by, all right? People have been able to buy their time with him. The only guys that are getting KO'd are guys like Dawkins that are trading with him that have no business being at heavyweight. Guys like Augusto Sakai. Augusto Sakai, man. I, I might even go as far as to say the biggest case of pillow hands in UFC history. Augusto Sakai. I should have put him on my pillow hands tier list. But... <laughs> <laughs> um, Shamil Gaziev's going to steamroll him. Just weigh him down. 260 pounds. This guy's been grappling since he was a kid. Jarzinho Rosenstrikes just, you know, finished his trial at the local jiu-jitsu gym, his one-week trial. <laughs> and Rosenstrikes' takedown defense is like... As soon, he basically stiffens up like a board. Straight up and down, like a board. And tries to density max his way through it, right? He just tries to be as dense as possible, but he doesn't have any technique. Gaziev's going to tip him over like a fucking tree in the woods that is one axe hit away from being fucking chopped to the mat, okay? Rosenstrike's going to have the most, you know, cow tipping type of takedown that, that's, that's freaking put on him, man. He's going to get tipped over like it's nothing, all right? Shamil Gaziev's going cow tipping this weekend. And he's tipping over Rosenstrike, who is going to fall. He's going to hit the mat. It's going to be a big, heavy sound. And the next thing you know, Shamil Gaziev is going to be just freaking smudging him left and right. Smudging him into the canvas. Just breathing on him. Breathing on him. Next thing you know, he's going to get one of those big heavyweight submissions. Kimura, maybe an arm triangle. And we'll see him fight Muhammad Usman after if Muhammad Usman can beat Mick Parkin. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching this video. Let me know your thoughts in the comments if you disagree with any of these picks. And until next time.